Well, it's my desire to bring to you a message every time I speak to you, something that maybe uh, you haven't heard before, something interesting. I don't want you guys to waste your time coming here. I want to offer you something to think about and something maybe even to challenge you with a little bit. But what I really want to do is feed you. I want you to have some food. I want you to have some spiritual food so that when you go home through the week, you can consider this and, and, and wrestle with it and hopefully grow. It's my desire to continue to grow in my knowledge of God. It's my desire to continue to grow in my understanding of Scripture. And I hope that is also your desire. To grow, sometimes we must examine what we believe to be true. We must exa examine them against reason, but most of all against Scripture itself. Scripture is where we get truth from. This morning we're going to look at three passages. Two of them are from Luke chapter 1, and they involve the fascinating account of Mary visiting Elizabeth while she was pregnant. And the third passage will be from Psalm 139. I'm glad that Lee mentioned all the prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament, because we're going to look at one, and I believe Psalm 139 is one of those. From these three passages, I hope to present you with a fresh perspective of God's deep love for the Son and His deep love for His people. And the theme for the fourth week of Advent is love. And focusing on this aspect of God's character is quite appropriate this morning. I hope that the title of this message, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, brings to your mind Psalm 139. How many of you know that psalm when you, see, when you hear that phrase? Some of you do. It's a wonderful psalm, powerful. I'm sure you recognize some of the imagery in it. In the NIV, it reads like this, starting in verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know, them, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. That passage is often used when, uh, for proponents of uh, the, the, uh, uh, those that are against the abortion movement. They'll use that passage and say, look, God, God formed the babies and, and, and all this. And, and that's true. It's, it's a good passage to go to. The psalmist, which happens to be David in this case, he describes God in that psalm as being everywhere. David cannot escape God's presence. And he's not complaining about that. He's, uh, he's excited about that. Everywhere he goes, there God is. In this psalm, he says that God is so devoted to him that he cannot escape him. He's even in there in the womb. He was there. God was there while he was being formed. David also describes God as knowing the words that he will speak before he even says them. And that he has planned every step in David's life. God has written him in a book, guiding and foretelling all of his steps. So who is this psalm about? Is it about me? Is it about David? Is this psalm to be taken literally? Are all of our days pre-planned by God? Have they all been written in a book? Do we have free will? That's the question that arises, I think, when you read something like that. Has God determined my steps before I take them? Do I have a choice in the matter? Is this to be taken literally or figuratively? Is David using poetic language to describe an intimate relationship with God? In 2 Samuel, towards the end of David's life, these words are written. It says, David, the son of Jesse, speaks. David, the man who was raised up so high. David, the man anointed by the God of Jacob. David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His words are upon my tongue. David is a prophet. The Holy Spirit speaks through him. And we see the clearest evidence of this when we read the Psalms in that light. David is many times speaking of things 
that he doesn't know about. He's prophesying. Many times the words written, when written about the psalmist, are not to be taken literally. But the beautiful thing is, when they refer to the Messiah, they often are to be taken literal. Psalm 139 describes the omnipresence of God. God is everywhere. He is there when David wakes. He's there when David sleeps. If David goes to the highest heavens, God is there. If David were to go to the depths of the ocean, God would be there. Amen. God is described by David as being omnipresent. He is everywhere. And everywhere David goes, God is there. And there are very few that would argue that God is not omnipresent. And even though this doctrine is very established, the Bible presents us with a God that isn't everywhere at all times. This is what's so fascinating about Scripture. How do we get these, how do we reconcile these two ideas? God is everywhere, claims to be everywhere. David claims that God is everywhere. But the Bible paints a different picture. Throughout Scripture, we see that God will at times lead people in places. Other times, He visits His people. And even stranger yet, there are times that He sends angels to give Him reports about what is happening down here. In Genesis, God is not always present with Adam, even in the garden. He comes and goes. And after Adam and Eve sin, their punishment is banishment from Him, from His presence. He sends them away. We get a glimpse of the role that angels play in the very first chapter in Job. They come and they report to God all the things that are going on down on earth. We read in Genesis at the time of Abraham that God sends His angels to visit Sodom and Gomorrah to confirm if the reports of their wickedness are accurate. God says that their cries have reached Him in heaven. It says this in Genesis 18. So the Lord told Abraham, I have heard a great outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah because their sin is so flagrant. I am going down to see if their actions are as wicked as I have heard. If not, I want to know. It's a little strange from a God who is omnipresent. He has to come down or send angels to check it out for him. You'll recall when Elijah was running from Jezebel, he's told to wait for God. Elijah is met with fierce wind, with fire, and an earthquake. But God was not in those things. In Ezekiel 10, we see a vivid description of God's glorious presence leaving the temple. And then it leaves Israel. If God is everywhere at once, if He fills everything, how can these things be true? You know, we instinctively pray many times, Lord, go with me as I travel. Oh Lord, be with so and so. But if we're consistent in our belief that God is everywhere, those prayers are, are kind of silly. Maybe what we're really saying is, Lord, remind us that you're with us when I go. Or Lord, let us feel your presence or keep us safe. But it seems we instinctively know that God isn't everywhere. When Israel was in the wilderness and Moses was with God on the mountain, Israel sinned by worshiping the golden calves. You remember that story. God told Moses he would no longer travel with them. Instead, he would send his angels to lead them. And then God says this to the people of Israel. He says, You are stubborn and rebellious people. If I were to travel with you for even a moment, I would destroy you. It's fascinating. I want to be very clear. I believe that God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. He can be if He chooses to be. He can also remove Himself if He wants to. And we see that throughout Scripture. Just because God is omnipresent doesn't mean He has to be present all the time. And He chooses to remove Himself or limit uh, exposure to Himself as a punishment sometimes. Just like it's possible for God to be everywhere at once, He also has the ability and freedom to be absent, to leave. He does not have to be everywhere at once. 
And it's clear from Scripture that he can choose to limit his presence. Also appears that he can limit his omniscience and his omnipotence. And he often does this to allow us to have free will. God can be everywhere and anywhere that he wants. Remember when Solomon builds the temple and God's glorious presence fills the temple. The earth shakes and God is there. The people have to leave because God is there. His presence is there. His presence is there. And God dwells inside of the Holy of Holies. But then, like I said in Ezekiel 10, because of Israel's unrepentant hearts, because of their continued sin, the Spirit of God, His presence, leaves the temple and leaves Israel. This happens right before they go into exile. The temple is destroyed by the Babylonians. Jerusalem is destroyed. The Babylonians take all of the Israelites that they want with them. The rest that they leave go to Egypt. And so God is gone and the land is devastated. After 70 years, the Israelites are allowed to return and they rebuild Jerusalem and they rebuild the temple. They dedicate the temple. But God doesn't show up. His spirit does not return to the temple. And they know this. And they consider themselves to be in a spiritual exile. They are still, even though they've returned to the land, God is not there. And so they wonder, how can we have a covenant relationship with God when He's gone? How can we, how can we be restored and reconciled to Him? Well, their only hope is the prophecies of the Messiah. Israel looks forward to the time when God will return to the land, when He will again occupy the temple, when He will show favor to Israel and give them their king. At the time, of the, new, at the, time the New Testament opens, it has been over 500 years since God has left Israel. And it has been over 400 years that God has spoken to Israel through the prophets. The last book in the Old Testament it's written 400 years before the events in the New Testament take place. During that 400 years, Israel has had unrest, invasion. They've had war from within and without. The dynasty of David has ended. Their current king, Herod, is not a descendant of David. In fact, he's an Edomite. He's a descendant of Esau. And he was appointed king by the Roman emperor not by God. The last prophet that God spoke through was Malachi. I want you to listen to this description that Malachi has of how God will come back to Israel. This is found in Malachi chapter 3. It says, Look, I'm sending my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you look for so eagerly, is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But who will be able to endure it when he comes? Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metal, or like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. He will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away the dross. He will purify the Levites, refining them like gold and silver, so that they may once again offer acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. Then once more, the Lord will accept the offerings brought to him by the people of Judah and Jerusalem, as he did in the past. And in verse 7, God says, Now return to me, and I will return to you. And then there's 400 years of silence. And after 400 years of silence, a priest is serving in the temple, Zechariah. He comes out of the Holy of Holies, waving his arms frantically, and he can't speak. And the people realize he has seen an angel. And then, just as the angel said, his elderly wife, who was barren, is now pregnant. And it looks like, maybe, God is doing something again 
in Israel. Maybe the exile's over. Maybe the Messiah will come and restore Israel to its God. Maybe God's Spirit will again shake the temple and fill it with His glorious presence. Well, how will He do it? Will He split the skies and come down on a cloud, as described in Malachi, with great power? Nope. God returns to Israel as an infant. The omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God returns as a helpless baby. He selects a virgin, a descendant of David, to be the mother of his only son. And Mary agrees to God's plan for her life, even though it may mean that she will be embarrassed and shunned. And now in our Advent story, we have two pregnant women, Elizabeth and Mary, a virgin who claims her son is the Messiah, the Son of God. And they come together in Luke chapter 1, verse 39. It says, A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. So Mary travels from her hometown of Nazareth and goes to Elizabeth. It's about 90 miles. And some people believe it takes, if you hurry, like it says she did, it could take you four days to get there. It says, At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. This is an incredible story. At the present, the sound of Mary's voice, the child that's inside of Elizabeth jumps. God chooses to fill Elizabeth with His Spirit. The God who's been absent for 400 years is now His Spirit is dwelling inside of Elizabeth. He does this because their meeting is special. And the Spirit-filled Elizabeth begins to make declarations about the unborn baby being formed inside of her younger relative. It says, Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. Amen. With this declaration from Elizabeth, we have the first two people in all of history that believe that Jesus is the Messiah. This is the coming together of two people with faith in the Messiah. They know who the Messiah is, and they consider Him their Lord. They believe God, and they're willing to be used by Him. I think Elizabeth and Mary are a picture of Christian fellowship. This is what happens when we come together. Spirit-filled people coming and declaring their faith in the Messiah, in Jesus Christ. They come together to encourage one another. This happens on Sunday morning during our services. It happens at other times during the week. Whenever we come together, we should be encouraging one another with these facts. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is the Son of God. Those things should excite us and inspire us. And what follows in this passage is Mary's prophetic response to Elizabeth. Mary responds to her because she is also filled with the Holy Spirit. And they begin to speak of things that they don't really understand yet. They're prophesying. This is found in Luke 146. Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord! How my spirit rejoices in God my Savior! For He took notice of His lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One is holy, and He has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear Him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. 
for he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. So Mary and Elizabeth visit for three months, encouraging one another, reminding each other of God's faithfulness. They take care of one another and they grow in their faith and their commitment to God. And then Mary takes that 90 mile trip back home. Verse 56 says, Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back to her own home. So in the, in the following passage, Elizabeth gives birth to John and there's this miraculous uh, event that takes place. Zechariah, who was un unable to speak, her husband, can now speak. And the people wonder, what is this child going to be? They're excited because God is beginning to move again in Israel. They're excited because it looks like God is coming back. The Spirit of God's presence will again dwell in Israel. And then Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit, gives this prophetic declaration about Jesus. He too has faith that Mary's unborn baby is the Messiah, the Savior of Israel. This is found in verses 67 through 75. Then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. Now we will be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us. He has been merciful to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant, the covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham. We have been rescued from our enemies so we can serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness for as long as as we live. So Israel at this time is under occupation by the Romans, Romans and you can see from Zechariah's prophecy that their hope is that they will be able to worship freely without fear of the Romans interfering. In fact they believe their Messiah will kick the Romans out and once again they will be on top. So Zechariah's prophecy is from the Spirit but at this point in the story the Spirit does not reveal everything to them. He gives them enough clues, but allows them to continue with the narrative that the Messiah is coming to free them from their earthly enemies. In the Advent story, we see the Holy Spirit more active than anywhere previously in Scripture. The Spirit fills Mary, it fills Elizabeth, it fills Zechariah. They speak of things they have not been told, they prophesy, and they place their faith in Jesus. This is all done through the power of and the intervention and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And even though the Spirit is moving and speaking through these prophets, the message is not going to be understood until after the resurrection. The way in which Jesus saves Israel and the world from their enemy is not understood until after He has been raised from the dead. And in the same way, the prophets in the Old Testament that were moved by the Holy Spirit, their messages were often not understood until the time they were fulfilled. And David, being a prophet himself, I believe his prophecy in Psalm 139 has been misunderstood for a long time. Psalm 139 is not a psalm about the omnipresence of God. It is a psalm about the intimacy between the Father and His Anointed One. Jesus is the one that David is speaking about in Psalm 139. Let's read it again. And as we read it, you'll be tempted to think that it pertains to you. You will think that it's about you. But this is about the Messiah. This is about Jesus. Now I want to remind you in John 5.39, Jesus said, You search the Scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the Scriptures point to me. We might be able to relate to some of the things that are in there. We might want to make them apply to us. But they are about Jesus, especially the Psalms. The Psalms point to Jesus. In fact, you'll read some of the Psalms and you'll say, what is, what is wrong with David or, or whoever the psalmist happens to be? Why does, why does the psalmist think that, that he is without sin and without blame? Because the psalmist is not speaking. The Holy Spirit is speaking. Once you begin to view Scripture this way and look for Jesus, 
in the, in the Old Testament scriptures, you will find them everywhere. And it is exciting. The scriptures really begin to open up. So let's look at Psalm 139 together. Begin in verse 1. O oh Lord, you have examined my heart, and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. Certainly that could apply to everybody, but it means more when it applies to Jesus. It says, you know what I'm going to say even before I say it. Remember in John, Jesus says, I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. His words are the words from God. This is how God knows what is going to be said. He says, you go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. In other words, he is anointed by God. This is his anointed one he's talking to. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. This was written, I believe, to encourage Jesus while he was alive, while he was on earth as a man. Remember, he's in the garden and he's thinking, Am I going to go through with this? If I die, will God bring me back to life? I think it's passages like this one that encourage Jesus to go through with it. These things were prophesied about him, and he can look at them, or he can remember back there and say, God is faithful. God will not forget me in the grave. There are other psalms that talk about being left in the grave and not, God not forgetting him or leaving him there. It says, If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Here's where it gets really good. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. God was there forming Jesus inside of the womb. He says, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book, every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. This is literally true when it's about Jesus. God has prepared every step for Jesus. God has a plan and Jesus was going to fulfill that plan. It says, how precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. So why does it matter if this psalm is about Jesus or about David or about me? You could say that about any passage, right? Why does it matter if that's about Jesus or about me? I don't think any of us would, would assume Isaiah 53 is about us, right? Might be able to find some, some truths in there that, that we can relate to. But once we begin to apply these things to ourselves, it starts to distort Scripture a bit. In fact, one of the things that I ha think has happened from this is that we have generated this idea that we do not have free will. That everything has been predetermined by God. And they'll point to this, this passage here and say that as evidence. But I believe this is about Jesus. Jesus' path was laid out. And He fulfilled it. But aside from that, one of the things that we can see in here is the deep love that the Father has for the Son. He is there in the womb, protecting, creating, creating His Son in there. I think that's what this is a picture of. 
Not, not the devotion that God has towards David or towards you and me, but the love that He has for His Son. He's with His Son everywhere. The omnipresent God who can remove Himself wants to be with His Son, and He is with His Son. His Son can go nowhere where the Father is not. The Father is devoted to the Son. God allowed Him to be beaten and bruised. The Son that He watched being formed, He allowed Him to pay the penalty for my sin. That is how much God loves me and you. When we put these things into the proper perspective, they have more significance and more meaning, I believe. I get excited when I think of how much God loves the Son and also how much He loves me. God allowed His Son to be spit upon and mocked, to be beaten and whipped so that you and I could be cleansed and so that His Holy Spirit could dwell inside of us. God wants to be with us. That is why He allows this. The omnipresent God has chosen to live inside of us through His Holy Spirit. His Spirit can do this because the Son willingly and obediently humbled Himself and left His place of glory. He became an infant so that He could live as a human and pay the penalty for our sin. He has reconciled us with God. He did this because He loves the Father. And the Father allowed this because He loves us. Philippians chapter 2. It says, Though He was God, He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, He gave up His divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When He appeared in human form, He humbled Himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated Him to the place of highest honor and gave Him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray.